Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Melanie. This is Adventures in Hostessville, and welcome to episode 17 of the Vintage Magazine Project and the first episode of the May 1933 Everyday Science and Mechanics. So those of you who have been watching the show for a while know that the first episode of the month is always the cooking episode. And this magazine did not make it easy for me. There are no recipes. There is nothing about cooking or food at all. But because I am thorough, I, uh, I did find something to go on. There is the 89 cent book sale here. Personal magnetism, fortune telling, Bible jingle rhymes, and they've got this book called Cocktails and Punches by Charles O'Delmonico's. So this is going to be the bartending episode. Now they even made it hard for me to just find that book because it's not actually called Cocktails and Punches, but again, thorough, I found it online. The book is called Cheerio! exclamation point, a book of punches and cocktails, how to mix them, and other rare, exquisite, and delicate drinks, including a chapter of celebrities and their favorite drinks by Charles, formerly of Delmonico's. Now, the funny thing is that in 1933, the country is still in prohibition. It is not actually technically illegal to drink in prohibition. The only things that are illegal are the sale, manufacture, and transport of alcohol. So I guess it's sort of like you can buy this book the same way that you can go into a head shop and get a copy of High Times, even if your state hasn't legalized marijuana yet. So I am going to make some of the drinks out of this book. Chapter one is called Morning Drinks, known as pickups or bracers, for when you stagger out of bed groggy, grouchy, and cross-tempered. Okay, when I think of a morning drink, I think of like a mimosa or um, maybe... I don't know, a Bloody Mary. I don't really know very much about drinks. That is not what Charles formerly of Delmonico's thinks of. Um, so the first drink is called the Charleston Bracer. So let's get this going. I don't have any cracked ice, but I got ice and I got a hammer. So prohibition is really on its way out. In April, there was something called the Cullen Harrison Act, which amended prohibition to say that you could by light beer and wine. So like three, two beer and then light wine was essentially they would sell like a wine cooler. So it'd be bottled, but it'd be part wine and part like carbonated water. And in fact, the day it passed, um, August Bush of Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis, he actually went and bought a giant wagon filled it up with cases of beer, attached it to this team of Clydesdale horses, and sent it from St. Louis to Washington, D.C. of a gift of beer to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that is how the uh, Budweiser Clydesdales started. One part brandy. Okay. One part port wine. Oh, this is going to have a cork. Oh, it is screw top. Yes! A screw top cork. That's class. Half a teaspoonful of powdered sugar. Ta -ta -ta. And <laughs> the secret ingredient. There are a lot of raw eggs in this book. It said that I was supposed supposed to use sufficient um, cracked ice. Do I look so professional in my dad's old bow tie? <laughs> oh, it's getting cold. That's, I don't make mixed drinks. I don't know how to do this. I don't, I, the, 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 this book assumes that you're a bit more of a cocktail person than I am. Oh. I didn't expect it to be so chocolate milk looking. Bottoms up. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> this is wow. 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 
So just like on your way to work, huh? <sighs> so Charles of Delmonico, sorry, Charles formerly of Delmonico, says in his introductory note, today that art of creating exquisite drinks to match exquisite moods is gasping on its deathbed and the dull ogre puritanism supplanting the skeleton sits gloating by the bedside waiting eagerly to hear the last death rattle. People are done with prohibition. They want it to be over. And kind of the unlikely standard bearer for it is this woman, Pauline Morton Sabin. Each sip gets easier, and that's a problem. Okay, so there is a temperance chapter in here. It's way at the end, but he says temperance drinks for whenever the stoic spirit of denial seizes you. Um, I kind of like non-alcoholic drinks sometimes, and sometimes I like it to not just be a Diet Coke and to seem fancy. So I am going to try making the soda cocktail. Okay, so Pauline Sabin is born in 1887 as Pauline Morton, and she comes from a family. Her grandpa on her paternal side was the Secretary of Agriculture under Grover Cleveland. He's the guy that started Arbor Day. Her dad was Secretary of the Navy under Teddy Roosevelt, and her uncle, Joy Morton, is the Morton of Morton Salt. So they got some money. So in 1907, she gets married. It doesn't last long, but it, it gets her a couple of kids. She remarries in 1916 to Charles Sabin, and he is the president of the First Guarantee Bank. So that is um, J.P. Morgan's bank. So it's not like she's, you know, got a slum now that she's a divorcee or anything. They've got a ton of money. They build this giant house in Southampton. It's got, you know, 11 bedrooms, 11 bathrooms, tennis courts, all this stuff. And they start entertaining all the time. They're both very politically active, but interestingly, he is a Democrat. She is a Republican because <laughs> there used to be a time when that could still happen. So she is very active in the Republican Party, and she is the first delegate, the first female delegate from New York to the Republican National uh, Committee. But one thing that she and her husband do agree on, if it's not politics, is they are both enormously anti-prohibition. Now, she wasn't always. Um, when Prohibition first started, she says she was moved by the word pictures of the agitators, I think was her phrase. But she, much like everybody else in the world, notices that it, it isn't working. So now a bottle of cold soda water. I have a soda stream. I've always wanted one of those things like they have in like a Marx Brothers movie where they can squirt you in the face with it but they're hard to come by. You have to have CO2 tablets or something like that. So soda stream it is. Oh, it says to remove the ice before serving. Soda cocktail, iceless, powdered sugar everywhere. Let's see how it is. Well, it's fine. It doesn't really taste like anything. I had hoped it was going to be a little more exciting. Is there still sugar all on the bottom there? Stir this up a little bit more. Nope. Okay, so the next one that I want to try is from the fancy wine drink chapter. For the pink-jowled, round-paunched, side-whiskered lover of red, gold, purple, and plain white wines. The one that I'm gonna make is called the Baclanova Nectar. So the big thing that really changes Pauline Sabin's mind about prohibition is that people are ignoring it. They are just flat out ignoring it. And I don't mean like the street corner souses who are now drinking denatured alcohol or whatever. All of these major politicians that she's always got coming over to her house for a party. And she's, you know, she says that she'll see them, particularly on her side and the Republican side, 
tends to be the dry candidates. People are coming to her houses for these parties and she's like, oh, sure, you don't think it should be legal to drink, but you are more than happy to like show up here and drink all my liquor. She said, you know, what am I supposed to tell my sons? If they see that no one is paying attention to this law, if this is what youth are seeing, how can we say that, well now, but you have to listen to these other laws? It's just this one thing that you could ignore. She's like, nope, get it out of there so that we can have a law that we're actually following. She also feels, and I think rightly so, that it actually was safer when it was regulated. If a saloon keeper served alcohol to an underage kid, they're gonna lose their license. But she said in a speakeasy, it don't matter. Anybody can go in, drink anytime they want. In the 1928 election, she supports Herbert Hoover, even though he is the dry candidate, because behind the scenes he's saying like, no, I know it's not working, I'm gonna do something about it. But then he gets elected and he doesn't. So she's like, you know what, I'm done. And she quits the Republican committees that she's on, and she forms her own organization, which she calls the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Repeal. And when it starts, it's just her and two dozen of her friends that she has handpicked because they are rich, but also she has picked the ones that are smart, that are willing to actually do some work, the ones that are really sophisticated and, and in the newspapers all the time, uh, because she feels like that will draw in other people, and it works. Pauline Sabin is not some flapper standing on a table in a speakeasy with her bathtub gin, 23 skidoo, you know, like that's not her. She's this very classy, sophisticated woman. And that makes a lot of women in smaller towns feel like, oh, I wanna be part of that, I can do that. And it doesn't make me not a good woman. She doesn't actually make a statement on whether or not she thinks you should drink because she doesn't want to turn away the people that are really into temperance. And she's like, you know what? If you think the world would be better with no alcohol at all and you want to continue to fight for it and that is your cause, good for you. Go for it. This isn't working. She also keeps it really nonpartisan. And I think two years after she founds her organization, it has 1.5 million members, which is three times the membership of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected, and by 1933, prohibition is done, which means I can have another alcoholic beverage, so let's put together this baklanova nectar. The shredded rind of half a lemon, that's about this, and then a tablespoon of powdered sugar, the juice of a whole lemon. Oh, I didn't juice this lemon. The funny thing about um, this organization is that even though it was really, really successful, she doesn't keep it up afterwards. Some of the members of the organization were saying, well, what are we gonna do now? And she's like, nothing. We're done, this is disbanded. Which left her time for the, the new organization that she formed to uh, fight the New Deal. She is Still not really a Democrat. A few slices of cucumber with the skin on. And now we're gonna do equal parts, claret, champagne, and seltzer. I asked the guy at the wine store, and I went to like a big store to have the most selection. And I asked him, if he had heard of Claret, and he was like, no, never heard of it, and started to walk away from me and was like, do you, do you wanna help me figure it out? So I explained what it is, and then I found this thing that says Claret right on the label. Good Lord, if you are going to work at a wine store, you need to read a lot more vintage novels. <laughs> Sparkling water. Uh, Baklanova, it appears from the internet, there was a Russian actress that was very popular in the early part of the 20th century, and I can't even remember what her first name was because she was one of these, and I am Baklanova kind of people, so I'm assuming that it's, it's named after her. I should do this over the sink, is what should happen. Oh, 
lick her all over. It's, <laughs> but only if she says it's okay. Baklanova nectar. Ooh, it's tart, which is right up my alley. Okay, winner so far. So I'm gonna make another temperance drink and it's got ginger ale. Unfortunately, her husband, who was also very active in prohibition reform, does not live to see the 21st Amendment ratified. He dies of a stroke in October and then ratification happens in December. She gets married again to a guy named Dwight Davis. Uh, he is, has also been the secretary of something. He's also Davis as in the Davis Cup. She likes rich men. Uh, <laughs> then in World War II, uh, starting in 1940, I think she is the president of the Volunteer Special Services for the American Red Cross. But then they have to leave Southampton and move to DC for Dwight's job, I think in 1943, at which point she gets a job as a design consultant for the Truman administration because they're updating the White House and she's the interior decorator for it. She dies in 1955 after doing a lot of amazing things, not the least of which is getting prohibition reformed so that we don't have to drink cocktails called a milk fizz. This isn't good. This isn't good. Okay, it's time for the grand finale. Now what I really thought would be the appropriate ending to the show would be something from chapter nine, suicide drinks. For bankrupts, jilted lovers, gamblers losing streaks, examination failures, business depressions, and husbands caught cheating. And the one that really caught my eye is called the cholera cocktail, which is brandy, cut with port, cut with cherry brandy, cut with blackberry brandy, and then they specify use no ice. <sighs> liquor cut with liquor, cut with liquor, cut with more liquor, and liquor for a mixer. But I couldn't because the first thing they actually tell you is to put in a half a teaspoonful of Jamaica ginger. It's a patent medicine that caused tens of thousands of people to be paralyzed. I'm gonna do a mini episode on that and put it on Patreon. I'm also gonna put a bunch of different recipes and stuff on Patreon as well. So if you are into mixology and you wanna do some real prohibition stuff, check that out. It's very affordable at patreon.com slash adventures in hostessville. But I am going to do a grand finale, and the finale that I'm going to do is from chapter eight, hot drinks for the fevered, chilled, and cold. For wet feet, chattering teeth, cold spines, shivers, goose flesh, frozen fingers, and chill blain. So the recipe I'm going to make is called the blue blazer. It says to use two glass mugs, done, a teaspoonful of powdered sugar, with a wine glass full, it's a very non-specific measurement, of boiling water. That went all over the table too. The other one is gonna get a wine glass full of scotch whiskey. Oh my goodness, that's an entire bottle. Probably shouldn't drink the whole thing. Ignite the liquid with fire and while blazing, mix the ingredients by pouring from one mug to the other four or five times. If expertly done, it will have the appearance of a continued stream of fire, but the novice should be careful not to scald himself. I, I am the novice. I still have a burn on my hand from the prune whip in episode one. Well, that just put out the match. Maybe this isn't as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. Well, it doesn't set on fire. That doesn't work. This isn't a thing. 
This wasn't a grand finale at all. <laughs> oh, I don't like whiskey. So my grand finale is a bust, <laughs> but um, I will try more of these cocktails like I said, on Patreon. So check that out. You can also follow me on Facebook and Instagram. You can hit subscribe or like here. And next week we'll be doing something else, 1933. Thanks so much and have a great day. I didn't even go in the cup. <laughs>